the service. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as I said, we'd have 184 people registered for the event. We've got 95 people now with us and we'll probably pick up a few more as we go. Um, but uh, most people are from the UK, but we have had a few people uh, register from other areas of the world. So that's fantastic. Uh, so welcome to this UK School Record webinar for National Tree Week, wherever you are. Um, it will be recorded and available later. So if you've missed it or you have to leave early or uh, anybody else wants to watch it, then they can they could do so later. Um, and if you want to find out more after the event, then just go to our website, www.squirrelaccord.uk. Our two experts we have with us today are both strongly linked to the UK Squirrel Accord. Um, we have Dr. Charles Lane, who is a leading plant pathologist from FERRA and the, their lead for the uh, important citizen science observatory project as well. And who is focusing on the potential for gray squirrel bark stripping to exacerbate tree pests and pathogens. And Dr. Giovanna Masai from the Animal and Plant Health Agency, who is our lead fertility control project scientist. And um, we'll be looking at the issue of human wildlife conflicts and work on uh, fertility control problems to alleviate these issues. So the bark stripping of broadleaf trees by grey squirrels is a major problem, especially in large areas of England and Wales, um, yet it is a far less well-known problem than the grey squirrels impact on red squirrel populations in the UK and Ireland. Earlier this year, we secured funding from the, and let me get this right, Forestry Focused Future Knowledge Transfer Grant Scheme uh, to create a short film to help raise awareness of the problem. And we're very grateful for them for funding that. Um, so we're pleased to be able to launch the film today. Uh, and I want to thank everybody involved in its creation. I will stop my video and I will share. My, uh, Giovanna, can you stop your video at all? Or? Yeah, I will. And I will. So. Share my screen eventually. Um, so the video is available now on the UK Squirrel Accord uh, YouTube channel. So do feel free to share it with people and get this to work. Here it is. Healthy trees are vital for a sustainable future, providing clean air and water, sequestering carbon, supplying timber, supporting wildlife and enhancing human health and well-being. Yet they're under increasing pressure from rapid climate change, from pests and diseases and from invasive species that are spread around the world, deliberately or accidentally, through global trade and travel and can cause major environmental, economic and societal issues. Originally from North America, grey squirrels were introduced to areas of England and Ireland between 1876 and 1929 for ornamental interest. But their spread across large areas of the British Isles has caused local extinctions of red squirrels and profoundly damaged tree health through their bark stripping activities. Once the squirrel takes the bark off the tree, what happens is that it interrupts the sap flow. The sap flow is the kind of the blood, the juices that, that, that make help the tree grow. And so all the energy and photosynthetic capacity that goes into the green leaf matter gets transported down through the phloem. And, and that's, that's the stuff that gets damaged is what, what the squirrels are actually after. And it interrupts growth normal growth and interrupts total uh, volume growth but also the form and it's the form thing that the foresters get very upset set about but the total growth is the thing that, that, that matters in terms of uh, carbon sequestration and hence climate change. Grey squirrels are one of the major threats to our woodlands um, especially the creation of young mixed native woodlands as they are basically destroying them. Grey squirrels often target the healthiest and most vigorous trees, causing major damage and fatalities to ecologically and economically important broadleaf species. You can see down here, there was a little trial site of, of damage that was happened actually last summer. And the squirrel obviously liked this tree. Uh, so this summer's returned and you can see up here, taking the, taking the bark from all the way up and it's now killed the top of the tree. That matters the economics of, of, of broadleaf woodland management because once that tree is damaged, you, net, you fail to recover the value that you put into it in the first place. And whilst that might not sound insignificant, actually there, there are also other impacts. That tree will never 
achieve the great height that you of the trees, mature trees that you see see today. It'll just be a, a, a poorly misshapen tree. It will actually fail to deliver all the things that we're trying to deliver with with uh, climate change and on the carbon front. So it'll be suboptimal, considerably suboptimal uh, on on the carbon front. And what happens over time is it isn't this just this tree. This was the first year. Slowly but surely, it'll be that tree there and that tree there and that tree there. And uh, you get an attrition. And over a period of seven to eight years, you might find that 30, 40, 50, 60, even 80 percent, even 90 percent of the trees are damaged. While bark stripping causes major problems for hardwood timber growers, it also has a negative impact on the biodiversity that large trees can support as they grow and mature. So in terms of um, the biodiversity side of the woodland, what we want is that some of our trees will replace eventually the big veteran trees which have their own ecosystems with the niches for uh, plants and lichens, um, with niches for mammals and birds to nest and shelter, um, and the canopy shelter that they give to insects. So the problem with um, damage by grey squirrels, they don't just damage the timber potential of your woodland, they're going to stop your tree, your young trees becoming the next biodiverse uh, generation of veteran trees. So there's um, a misconception, I think, that uh, it's, it's a great thing to have um, damaged, tr uh, damaged trees. Uh, one of the things a lot of our woodlands are short of is deadwood. And there's a, a sort of misconception that a damaged tree it provides more deadwood. But actually, a dam the deadwood should be coming from old trees losing limbs or old trees having rot. But um, the squirrels are doing damage to young trees and a damaged 20 year old tree is not providing, is, it, that's not a part of a healthy ecosystem to have that deadwood coming from a young tree. That tree should be vigorous and healthy and there to replace the high canopy in the future. As science and technology evolves, new solutions to old problems are constantly being explored. In 2017, for example, the UK Squirrel Accord Partnership began research on an oral contraceptive for grey squirrels. Over the coming years, it's hoped this will offer an effective, less labour-intensive and non-lethal option for management. The reason for this research comes mainly from public demand for alternatives to um, lethal methods to manage wildlife. The project supported by the UK Squirrel Accord is something we are particularly keen on because it's a multi-year project that gives us the possibility of both developing and testing new contraceptives, oral contraceptives for wildlife. We've been involved and hope to be involved in some of the trial work on the new contraceptive that is being developed as a means of controlling grey squirrels. I think this is the, the great hope for us all in that this could be an effective way of significantly reducing the grey squirrel population. There's now a growing appreciation of the need to find new innovative solutions and to raise greater awareness of the issues our trees face. To this end, the Yorkshire Arboretum is building a new tree health centre to provide a hub for education and knowledge sharing. One of the things we want to do at the Tree Health Centre that we're building here at the Yorkshire Arboretum is to promote the concept of healthy trees in a healthy landscape for a healthy general environment for everyone. And that includes thinking about what trees to plant for the future. Do we plant things like sycamore, which are squirrel prone? Do we think of other things? Do we think of a mixture and so forth to counteract all this problem with tree pest diseases and squirrels. I think we need a healthy mixture in the woodland. We need sensible squirrel management and vigilance against all sorts of these problems that are affecting our trees. As we lose increasing numbers of broadleaf trees to grey squirrel bark stripping alongside pests and diseases, it's crucial that we focus even more on protecting the health of these important species, working together to ensure a truly sustainable future. Great. Well, I hope that worked for everybody, but um, if not, do please go back onto the YouTube channel and watch it through there. Um, and thanks again to you, again to everybody involved. Um, 
Thanks also to all the questions already sent in uh, when you registered. Um, I'd be keeping an eye on keeping an eye on collating those um, and also keeping an eye on the chat function. So if you have anything to ask during the course of the webinar, we will have a Q&A session at the end following the speakers. So do put it in there um, and we'll see what we get time for. Um, but now I want to hand over to the um, to the highly knowledgeable and well-renowned Dr. Charles Lane. I'm Charles Lane. I work for Ferro Science Limited uh, and I'm a plant pathologist. My actual background is in mycology uh, and I've worked in sort of uh, plant health and biosecurity for the past 30 years. Uh, and this is a picture of me sat in a tree, um, just so you know who I am. So if we go on to the next slide, please, Kay. Yep, so I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction just to set the scene around uh, emerging problems with plant health and biosecurity in the next slide, please, Kay. Um, so this is a, a, a commonly seen graph in talks, if you've um, uh, seen any talks about sort of plant health and biosecurity. Uh, in the top, in the bottom right hand corner, you can see uh, this is over a much longer period from about 1500 onwards. And you can see the number of this sort of exponential increase in the number of pests and pathogens and invasive species that have been recorded in the UK. In the top left hand corner, it's over a much shorter period over the last sort of, uh, over the last century. Uh, the little yellow dots are plant pests and the little green dots are tree pests. So it really does, does illustrate probably since about sort of 1970s, perhaps even the 1950s, there has been a steady and, and, and incre incremental rise in the number of findings of uh, plant pests and tree pests. Much of this driven by uh, globalization of trade and the fact we're now trading with countries where previously we wouldn't have traded with before, but also seeing the impacts of uh, climate change as well, making the conditions in the UK more suitable uh, for pests and pathogens uh, to thrive in our more milder conditions. If we go on to the next slide, please, Kay. Uh, bring us more up to date in uh, 2012. Um, eight years ago, and it was the first time that ash dieback, which is a fungal disease called Hymocyphus fraxineus, was found in the natural environment uh, in the UK for the first time. Uh, this led to a sort of major review of uh, plant health and biosecurity and the way that we thought about the world. Uh, and there were some very dramatic figures um, coming out of Europe about that perhaps up to 90% of ash trees in this country uh, would be killed due to ash dieback. Uh, and we go on to the next slide, please. This led to, I say, a major review. There was the Expert Task Force report in 2013, the new biosecurity strategy in 14, and the Tree Health Management Plan. Uh, plant biosecurity strategy is a very good read. It sets out the stall of how plant health and biosecurity should be viewed in the future. And we have spent the past six years actually significantly improving uh, and enhancing our plant health and biosecurity in the UK, all as a result of finding of ash dye back in 2012. Uh, so in the next slide, we're now going to look at a range of different emerging pests and pathogens. The first one I have talked about briefly is uh, ash dieback, uh, may also be called a uh, Calara dieback of ash, and may also be called by its scientific name Hymenocyphus fraxineus. Uh, these are the sort of symptoms, unfortunately, we've all come quite used to seeing. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the first symptoms of ash dieback, which is the uh, wilting of the shoots. Uh, the reason the uh, shoots are wilting is there's a lack of water and nutrients uh, at the extremities of the plant. And that is because there is a lesion on the stem, uh, which is girdling at the stem and, and shutting off the water and sugar supplies. As those leaves start to wilt, uh, then you start to see dieback. And on the left-hand side, you can see a very characteristic symptom of some regeneration growth with ash dieback on, with those characteristic dead stems and, and witchetty-like fingers. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, please, Kay. This is the most diagnostic feature of ash dieback. Uh, the spores... the stem into the uh, main stem and you see this characteristic brown lesion at the point of insertion of the side branch and um, with time that becomes quite dry and can become quite sunken as you can see in the middle picture and then on the right hand side you can see the more dried out lesion this is the most diagnostic feature of ash dieback you'll get wilting and a uh, dieback for many other reasons but on the young stems, this is the diamond shaped lesion, which is the most diagnostic feature for ash dieback. If we go on to the next slide. 
Uh, as I said, the disease was first found uh, in 2012 on the eastern seaboard. Um, when it was first found, it was unsure whether it was uh, just a single introduction or whether there had been several introductions. But we found over time through doing some extensive survey work, there had been a number of individual drug introductions. Although it was first found in 2012, probably had been introduced over the previous five to 10 years before that on infected plant material. But also there was evidence that spores of the fungus had blown in from continental Europe, where the disease had first been seen probably 10 or 15 years before. And although the disease uh, was found in Europe about 20 years ago, it actually originates from uh, Asia uh, and was introduced into Europe on infected planting material. Uh, a lot of the surveillance work in the first few years was carried out by uh, tree health and plant health professionals. But in the previous, uh, in, the, in the most recent years, probably the last three to five years, actually citizen science has taken over responsibility for a lot of that surveillance work. And you can see a very good distribution map of ash dieback in this country. So unfortunately, uh, it has been introduced. It has spread very widely and hence the uh, decision to stop taking statutory action against ash for ash dieback. In the next slide, <clears throat> we're going to look at the other threat to ash, which is still a very current and still a very worrying threat. And this is the emerald ash borer, Agrillus planipennis, uh, a beautiful beetle, um, absolutely stunning, quite small, only about seven and a half to 13 and a half millimeters. Uh, but they're also known as jewel beetles because they have these beautiful blue-green iridescent bodies. There are many jewel beetles in this country, and you may see jewel beetles on ash, but we are particularly concerned about the Agrillus planipennis, as this does not occur in this country. So the beetle itself is quite characteristic, but it's unlikely you're actually going to see the beetle in practice. What you should be looking out for is the D-shaped exit holes. Not surprising, it's quite a difficult job boring your way out of dense wood. Um, so therefore, if you're a D-shaped beetle, you're going to uh, bore the smallest hole possible, and hence you look for D-shaped exit holes. Again, they are quite small, commensurate with the size of the beetle. Moving on to the next slide, we can see the foliar damage that sometimes you might see on ash, on fraxinus species. Probably not quite so common to see this, but the, the adult beetle will actually feed on the uh, foliage. Moving on to the next one, Kay. Uh, these are the uh, symptoms of the uh, larvae of the beetle that do the majority of the damage. Uh, the larvae of the beetle develop inside the wood underneath the bark. And in the right hand side, you can see the, uh, the damage that it caused to the, uh, the sap wood uh, underneath the bark in the galleries that uh, move back and forth across the bark. Uh, and this is what is actually causing the lesions and will cause the damage and eventually kill the tree. That larvae will pupate and then it will bore out of the uh, bark, forming that D-shaped exit hole. Moving on to the next slide, please, Kay. Uh, again, uh, it occurs in China, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, Mag uh, Mongolia and uh, the Russian Far East. Um, and it has spread uh, uh, westwards. Uh, into uh, the Eurasian landmass, into Ukraine. So we are concerned that it is actually knocking on the door because it has been found in Ukraine and it has been found in Moscow, Moscow where it is spreading out of Moscow at about 25 miles a year. Where it has been particularly problematic has been in North America. It was introduced into the USA. It's first recorded in 2002, but no doubt it was previously there for a couple of years before. We don't know how it got into North America, but it does, has done a huge amount of damage. It was declared the most invasive damaging species in North America. Um, it's killed over 20 million frags in the species. It's caused a huge amount of economic damage. Uh, and it is important to remember that ash in this country is a very important host for many, many species of other insects. For example, 286 arthropods. So when an invasive species is introduced and is not controlled, it can become very damaging indeed. We're very lucky in this country has not been found in the UK. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, these are some uh, pictures uh, sent to us from uh, the situation in America. Top left hand corner, you can see a lovely avenue of fractionless trees in Toledo in 2006. Three years on, all those trees are dead. So it can have a very, very dramatic impact once it has been introduced and becomes established. Uh, luckily in North America, they don't actually have ash dieback. 
they are just dealing with emerald ash borer. Moving on to the next slide. And here it is a little bit closer to home. Uh, it was found in Moscow about three or four years ago. And here is a stand, an avenue of trees in central Moscow. All those trees are dead. One of the diagnostic features of any form of uh, girdling canker will be the ability of the tree to try and recover. And you get these epicormic shoot growths on the base of the tree. Uh, and that is very characteristic both of emerald ash borer and also of ash dieback. Moving on to the next slide, please. Um, so again, here are some. Uh, here you can see the damage occurring on uh, Fraxinus excelsior in uh, Moscow. One of the things which is uh, quite interesting with emerald ash borer, the adult beetles selectively pick out uh, trees which are stressed. Um, so uh, one of the concerns that we have, because we have ash die back in this country, would we have an, a, a more significant problem than they've already had in North America, because we have an agent that is already killing our ash trees and encouraging um, emerald ash borer to colonize. Uh, and the way that they find emerald ash borer in North America is actually to girdle trees. They'll go into a, a fractionless forest, they will girdle the tree, and then they'll come back three, six months, however long later, and look for signs of the uh, pest, because the pest actively seeks out dead and dying trees. Um, so there is great concern from me uh, as, a, as a plant health consultant, that actually if we have an agent which is girdling trees, uh, such as squirrels, which could be bark stripping. That is effectively how you find emerald ash borer in North America. Um, so there's a nasty interaction there between something which is going to girdle a tree and an invasive species which yet occur in this country. So you can see that synergistic effect between gray squirrel bark stripping uh, and an invasive species which is yet to arrive. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So again, con continuing to develop that theme about how uh, invasive pests and pathogens might interact with gray squirrels. This is another uh, North American disease. Uh, this is uh, Cryphonectria parasitica. Uh, it's a fungal disease and it causes sweet chestnut blight disease. Um, and as you can see, the distribution of the organism is Asia, uh, large parts of uh, North America. Uh, when it was introduced into North America, it killed three and a half billion American chestnut trees. Uh, and I believe you're very lucky now to see any kind of sweet chestnut tree in North America. Uh, it was introduced in Europe in the 1930s, uh, and it has been uh, sitting in southern Europe, um, Italy, Spain, France, um, for quite a few years. Um, but it is on a northward march. Moving on to the next slide, please, Kay. Uh, these are the characteristic symptoms uh, on sweet chestnut. Uh, you get stem cankers, you get dieback because of the, uh, the lesions. It's in the uh, top right hand slide. And then as the fungus develops, it produces large numbers of fungal fruiting bodies. These are sort of microscopic structures about the size of a pinhead. And each of those contains large numbers of sticky spores which we look in the next slide. Uh, again, here is a characteristic lesion. Again, you can see it's centered on a side branch. But as those little fungal fruiting bodies erupt through the surface of the bark, you get a tendril of sticky spores. Now, each of those tendrils is probably only sort of three to four millimeters long, um, but they perhaps contain a few thousand spores each. They're produced in a gelatinous, sticky mass um, purposely. Um, because the fungus wants to be distributed as far as possible. So if we were to touch that lesion, a bird was to land on that lesion, an animal was to run over that lesion, its whole dispersal process is about trying to be sticky and stick onto something else so it gets moved. So again, you can see any kind of interaction with an infected plant, any kind of physical touching, spores will be picked up and spread to the next uh, um, uh, um, plant. It's a wound pathogen, so again, it preferentially likes to colonize uh, wounded tissue. A perfectly healthy tree with perfectly healthy bark is going to be much more resistant to infection. So if, if a, a tree is wounded, then there is an infection site waiting to be infected. Uh, and uh, if spores are splashed, blown or carried onto that wound, they are more likely to be infected. So again, you can see that potential for synergistic effect. Um, moving on. So sweet chestnut blight, as I mentioned before, was 
uh, was a problem, uh, particularly in North America, had been in Southern Europe for quite a few years. But in 2011, it did pop up in the UK for the first time. And as you can see from this map, although very uh, limited in its distribution, it is in some of the uh, key broadleaf growing areas in the country. And it is something that we are actively trying to manage and prevent further spread. But it is a, a pathogen that has been introduced into this country uh, and uh, inevitably, I suspect it will continue to spread. Um, and our, our aim is to slow that spread as much as possible. So that's sweet chestnut lice, Cryphonectria parasitica. Uh, moving on to the next one, please, Kay. Uh, this is another one which is, uh, isn't, this one actually isn't present in the country. And this is called plain wilt balls by Serratocystis platanii. Again, it's a fungal disease. And you can see the two trees in the uh, left hand picture. You can see on the tree on the right is showing severe symptoms of plain wilt. It's a vascular disease. Uh, so the fungus produces uh, spores and mycelium that enter the, vac the vascular tissue. And that is responsible for transporting obviously uh, sugars and water. Um, so obviously you're likely to see a yellowing and discoloration of the foliage and you're likely to see a dieback of the tree as we turn off the water and sugar supply. Uh, interestingly, as the uh, tree starts to die due to plain wilt, uh, then the fungus obviously has to move away from a dead and dying tree and find another tree to infect. What happens is the bark lifts and bubbles and breaks because underneath that bark is a big thick mat of mycelium, of fungal growth. That fungal growth has quite a sweet fruity odor because what it is trying to do is to encourage uh, insects uh, to uh, feed and pick up the spores and the mycelium and the fungus and then spread it. This is uh, directly analogous to uh, Dutch elm disease. And I think we've all seen what happened to elm in this country as a result of an invasion of a fungal disease like a serratocystis. Uh, and uh, this is a very closely related fungus. Um, and again, it's something which is of great concern. It is present in uh, southern Europe. It's not present in this country. There's been a huge amount of work done by the Tree Council and the Tree Officers Association to make people aware of this because it would be a huge threat to uh, London plain uh, trees, obviously. Moving on to the next slide, please, Kay. Again, here's the distribution. Again, North American issue introduced into Europe, uh, not currently in this country. It has had a major impact in uh, southern France in the Canal de Midi region um, because this is uh, where they have a large number of plane trees lining this UNESCO World Heritage Site. The disease was introduced and has spread. One of the mechanisms that they believe it has spread in this country is by uh, people boating uh, bumping their boat into an infected tree, um, poddling off down the canal, bumping into a perfect healthy tree, wounding the tree and introducing the fungus at the same time. And they believe that is one of the mechanisms of how it is spread down the uh, Canal de Midi region. So you can see the importance of wounding for distribution and dispersal of these invasive species. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so it is a wound pathogen, uh, commonly occurs uh, through spores infecting fresh wounds on healthy plane trees, may also be spread by wind, birds, insects and tree care tools. It is a highly infectious and highly uh, um, disease spread by contamination. So it's something we are very concerned about. and We put a huge amount of effort into preventing this being introduced. Uh, just uh, moving on to the next one. Just another example of one of these other wound-based pathogens. This is oak wilt, used to be called serratocystis. So again, you can see how closely related it is to plain wilt and Dutch elm disease, uh, but now goes with this new name, Brezziella. Uh, again, a nasty disease in North America. Again, it's a wound pathogen, which is causing significant dieback, blight and death of oak trees, not present in Europe at all, and certainly not present in the UK. And in the next slide, uh, you can see the characteristic damage to the vascular tissue, just a reminding us where the fungus is uh, just beneath the bark surface in that vascular tissue. Um, again, moving on, please, Kay. Uh, again, uh, entirely a North American project problem, not even been introduced to Europe yet, something we are highly concerned about. And I think we would feel it could have a potential impact in this country. But uh, we're very pleased to say it's not present in this country yet. Moving on. 
Um, so I just thought it'd be helpful having, a, I do appreciate there's a very quick whiz through, but I just wanted to raise awareness about some of the emerging issues. But if we look in the next slide, here's some further information. A couple of places I suggest to find some excellent information. Uh, obviously, forest research are a font of all knowledge. Uh, lots of really helpful guidance about pest and disease resources, and you can search that. Uh, DEFRA's UK Risk Register, this is an excellent resource for anybody who's interested in pests and diseases. Uh, there's now over a thousand different pests and pathogens listed on the UK Risk Register. Uh, it's in the public domain. Uh, if you haven't used it, then it's a very simple tool to use. You can search for information about a particular pest, but also importantly, if you're interested about a particular host, uh, you can actually search for, say, Castanea and find out all the different pests and pathogens which are threatening uh, those particular host species. And then finally, if you want to go a little bit uh, broader, you can also look at the EPO, the European Plant Protection Organization, uh, a very useful resource to understand on what is happening in Europe and also some excellent pictures to help you identify it. Uh, and moving on, Kay, thank you. A uh, project that I'm heavily involved in is called Observatory. Uh, this is a have some very uh, worrying pests and pathogens on there, uh, including things like plain wilt and uh, sweet chestnut blight, which I've talked about. The very good thing about the observatory project in the process of training all our volunteers, in the next slide you can see the wide range of different resources. These are all freely available to anybody. Uh, in the middle picture, you can see uh, a, a multicolored diagram. This is actually a very good pest and pathogen calendar. So you can look from January to December to see what is what is a good time of year to survey for. There's some fantastic diagnostic guides which are all downloadable, they're all free. And there's loads of training advice on how to recognize symptoms and how to record the health of trees. Um, so please uh, draw on that information. And in the next slide, uh, Kay's too good at this, you can tell. Uh, central to, I think, all of the tree health work we're doing is a central reporting mechanism, uh, and this is called Tree Alert. Scotland, Wales, and England, you'll be reporting all your tree health concerns to Tree Alert, and I'd encourage you to do that. If you're in Northern Ireland, you would be reporting this by Tree Check. Uh, but this is, again, free, available online for all of, all of us to report symptoms of any tree pests and pathogens and concerns. That information is fed to forest research and forest research can then gather that information and respond to your inquiry. So if you're concerned about any pest or pathogen problems, please use Tree Alert. And moving on to the next slide. Uh, and again, this is just to say that that is the link and there is a link to Tree Alert. So again, I'd encourage you all of you to report any concerns about pests and pathogens to Tree Alert. Moving on to the next slide. So again, uh, just to really bring that back home again, if we move on to the next slide, uh, this is the R or R slide. Um, the, obviously it is very divided in your opinion, um, but I am hoping as a result of all the work of the UK Squirrel Accord, as a result of these kind of lectures uh, and, and public opportunity, people have a much uh, better understanding of the impacts on the gray squirrels. Uh, and as we can see in the next slide, um, this is the sort of damage that perhaps we are all familiar with and we are all a lot used to, but I suspect the majority of the people would walk, walk past that and not really appreciate what they're seeing. You know, we are seeing a, a huge amount of impact and damage there, uh, and we are seeing greater damage on things like ash uh, and a wide range of broadleaf trees. So, you know, we are perhaps comfortable with understanding what is happening, um, but perhaps we need to make people more aware of that. I think also importantly in the next slide, this is a slide I've tried to summarize uh, and I tried to think about the impacts of grey squirrels on tree health, uh, the direct impacts, and I think this is very well brought out in the uh, publicity video at the start. The structural damage to scaffold branches, this obviously has a, a big impact on urban and peri-urban areas where people might be concerned about health and safety risks. Uh, perhaps in a more forestry and woodland se setting where you're concerned about more the quality and quantity of timber, actually growth abnormalities are going to have a major problem. So we do see that loss of timber quantity and quality. We do see increased hazard rating due to structural damage, and we do see a decreased planting of broadleaf trees. They're the probably things that we more think of directly. 
what I'm interested in is is also is trying to magnify the concerns about the indirect impact of grey squirrels. Um, the creation of wounds and infection sites for disease and decay. I think this is really important to understand that many of the pests and pathogens which are present in this country but are also threatening this country are actually wound pathogens. They need a leg up in life. And the feeding damage of a squirrel uh, on a young tree provides that wound which helps pests and pathogens to uh, infest or infect uh, those trees. Girdling of branches leads to dieback. That obviously leads to much more stressed trees. Again, this makes me concerned about what we're doing is creating a standard trees which is more susceptible to these pests. So when and if uh, emerald ash borer arrives in the arrives into this country for the first time, if it finds a large population of stressed trees, then we're only making its journey and its uh, establishment so much easier. I think the other area which I'm also interested in as well is uh, can grey squirrels act as a vector of disease? i uh, take you back to that picture of those lovely little orange spore tendrils, those sticky mucilaginous spores uh, waiting to be spread. Um, they have evolved to be spread. Something needs to spread them. Um, so obviously uh, the activity of squirrels um, running over the surface of uh, infected branches, um, that have, they have the potential to pick up these sticky spores, will they pick it up on their feet, uh, will they actually even get it into their mouth. Um, there is actually very little information in pericor scientific evidence about uh, grey squirrels actively transmitting uh, pests and pathogens, but I think it's something we should be very aware of and very conscious. So in many ways, they are the they are the perfect um, dissemination tool um, because they are picking up um, uh, pests and pathogens. Uh, they are moving around large areas and they are creating wounds which are infection and infestation sites. Uh, and then in the final slide, uh, this is an example of where there has been a publication. As you can see, it goes back to 1977. Uh, this is sooty bark disease called by Cryptostroma corticola, which is a fungal disease. Uh, and it was interesting to read in that paper that viable conidia, these are the fungal spores um, which would be responsible for establishing a new infection, were carried in the buccal cavity and claws of grey squirrels. So there is direct uh, scientific evidence there that grey squirrels can be responsible uh, for moving fungal spores around both on their claws and in their mouth parts. Um, so you can see why as a plant health and biosecurity consultant, I am so concerned about the impact of grey squirrels and their potential to magnify uh, the spread and the impact of uh, pests and pathogens. Uh, and on that happy note, I'll say thank you to Kay for moving my slides on so beautifully. Uh, and I shall uh, stop uh, to pass on to the next speaker. And thank you for listening. That's great. Thank you very much, Charles. I think really interesting and really concerning in equal measures. So um, we'll come to the, I know there are a couple of questions on the thing, but we'll come to those in a minute and I will mute myself and sort the video and um, try and share my screen for you, Giovanna. There we go, you should be fine now. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Giovanna Massey. I work for the Animal and Plant Health Agency in York, based in York, and I'm leading a group of researchers working on mitigating human wildlife conflicts. So today, um, Kay asked me to talk about human wildlife conflict in general, um, fertility control in general, and then, which I will do in the first slides, and then I'll zoom in in uh, the main research project that we're carrying out now that is about developing and delivering oral contraceptives for gray squirrels. Next, please. So um, human wildlife conflicts are increasing worldwide uh, and they include and not limited to damage to crops, forestry and property, 
disease transmission, impact on native plant and animal species, road traffic accidents, livestock predation, and attacks on humans. Next one, please. From the wildlife side, we talk about uh, human wildlife conflicts. Um, these are very good examples of species that are what we can call overabundant. There are many animals and they're having a significant economic or ecological impact. Uh, I have chosen intentionally a couple of species. One is, is the squirrel, of course, the gray squirrel, and the other one is the wild boar because I worked for many, many years on wild boar too. And because wild boar, if you look at the, the list of um, impact by wildlife, you can tick each of them for the wild boar. Um, wild boar are in live everywhere, um, particularly in Europe, but also in the UK and are increasing in the UK. Um, there are wild boar also found in beaches, in private houses, in swimming pool, in towns, and obviously in forest. There are uh, a number of other wildlife species here. The examples include native, non-native, former native species, and livestock. Feral livestock are part of the wildlife that we work on to mitigate the impact by feral livestock. Next one, please. This is the only uh, graph that I'll show about increasing um, number of animals. This is wild boar shot dead, so culled in Europe uh, in the last 30 years. And if you look at the, in the different countries, in 17 countries, and if you look at the bottom right, there's Poland, France, and Germany. Until 2012, um, they were culling between 200 and 700,000 wild boar per year. Last year, Germany alone culled 800,000, and they're still growing. And these are animals, that, as I said, that can cause very, very significant environmental and ecological um, and uh, economic impact. Next, please. So that was from the wildlife point of view. From the human uh, point of view, um, I was very surprised when I saw this map. This is the map of the human population, uh, how dense the population is around the world. And as you can see, Europe is quite crowded, overcrowded. So the, the second message is not only too many animals, but also too many people. And on the top right graph, you have the graph where it shows the proportion of the rural and urban human populations around the world. The urban population has just surpassed the rural population. And these, in, in, so there are more people now living in towns and cities around the world than in the countryside. And this has significant implications for wildlife management. Next one, please. So the num there are a number of people around the world, particularly those uh, that live in towns that are disconnected with nature and see nature with a romantic view. So they have um, images of deer, stags roaring and salmon leaping. The other part of animals that they see, um, they could see these animals in supermarkets, but they are blobs. They don't have tails or, or legs or eyes, so they're not really seen as animals. And then there's the romanticized version of Bambi and Walt Disney, which is also an important driver of how people feel about managing their life. The chicken is there because uh, London, uh, New York Zoo had chicken just to show people where Kentucky Fried Chicken came from because a lot of people had no idea of what a, a chicken, uh, a fried chicken used to be when it was a live animal. Next one, please. And as a society, we have very divided opinion about uh, animals. Uh, some are considered pets, some are considered pests, uh, and even those that are considered pets um, should probably not be considered pets. Uh, you, don't, you don't want to see a fox on a leash. You certainly don't want to see the raccoon on the top right. 
uh, the raccoons are non-native in Germany. Um, and a few years ago, Germany was culling 130,000 raccoons. And raccoons are a bit like big rats. They will eat everything. They will have also a very big impact on biodiversity. Next one, please. So the reason why human wildlife conflicts are increasing is that we have created and we are creating the ideal conditions for wildlife. The forests, at least in Europe, in many parts of Europe, are increasing. We love feeding animals. We shouldn't, but everywhere, even if you have um, sick signs saying do not feed animals, you routinely see people feeding animals in front of these signs. We have crops uh, in many parts of the year. Uh, we have created refuge areas in towns and we are feeding animals like uh, birds in our gardens. Next one, please. So this is a graph showing the increase in forest, certainly in Europe, uh, in uh, the area interested by forest in Europe, and that's increasing. And, and wildlife are taking advantage of this. Next, please. To mitigate human wildlife conflict, we have two sets of methods. The little ones, so we cull, we kill, we shoot, we poison, which has been used uh, traditionally for many, many, many years. And then the non-lethal ones that are a bit more recent. And today we're going to talk about fertility control in particular. Next, please. We do have contraceptives for wildlife. They are called a single dose, or they could be a few doses, injectable vaccines. Um, and an example is Gonacon. All these pictures are examples of species or projects that are ongoing with my group. So we're working on a number of projects where there are too many wild boar, too many koipu, too many badgers, too many cattle, um, and or, or obviously gray squirrels. We could, and we do, inject animals with this contraceptive uh, and the contraceptive will create antibodies to a hormone that essential, is essential for reproduction. So you will have a vast majority of animals that will not be fertile for a number of years. So we do have app applications, we can do it, but obviously we need to capture animals and that's a, a big cost and effort which is why we need oral contraceptives. And that's exactly why the project on gray squirrels was born. Next, please. Um, Dr. Lane uh, listed some of the issues with gray squirrels. I'm adding some more. Um, they are implicated in the decline of the native red squirrel. There are an estimate of um, 2.5 million gray squirrels in the UK. In the maps, you can see that uh, the UK used to be mainly red, i.e. covered by red squirrels, and now is mainly gray, i.e. that the gray squirrels are there and the reds are not there anymore. Bar stri stripping, we have uh, already mentioned this, uh, but the gray squirrels are also an iconic species. People love to see them, people love to feed them and they are present in urban park and gardens, and people often is, is one of the few mammals that people can see, which creates a problem. The uh, tree on the right, this is the result of a couple of squirrels in a few hours debarking this tree, by the way. Next one, please. So, the uh, forest research a few years ago published public attitude survey uh, on the social acceptability of methods used to manage squirrels in the UK. And the results were very interesting because out of almost 4,000 responders, more than 60% rated contraception as acceptable or highly acceptable. They really wanted it. And less than 20% people were happy about using poison to uh, control gray squirrels. So as I was saying, uh, a lot of people are demanding loudly that something that is not killing is used to mitigate human wildlife conflicts. Next one, please. So for many years, we have worked on uh, contraceptives to manage wildlife, and we drew up a list of what are the 
ideal features of the contraceptive. So we would like something to have no side effects on welfare, physiology and behavior, uh, ideally to be effective in the long term with a single or a few doses, ideally to, for it to be oral and also to be inexpensive to produce and to administer, to be species specific, so to, to be aimed at the target species only, to have no effect on spatial and social behavior and to be deliverable to a large proportion of the population. And I'm hoping through the next slides, when we zoom in the fertility control project for gray squirrels, to give you a flavor of the complexity of this project, of such a project. Next one, please. So this is a five-year project. It, it's supported by the UK Squirrel Accord and we are incredibly grateful for it. It's, uh, the cost is about 1 million. It involves 10 researchers at my laboratory, six collaborating organizations, and it's divided into three legs. The development of an oral contraceptive suitable for gray squirrels, the delivery of a contraceptive for gray squirrels in a species specific way, and then the modeling. So we are modeling the impact of fertility control and culling on populations of gray squirrels. I'm going to talk about only the development and the delivery because we don't have time to do uh, everything, but I would be happy to answer questions at the end or answer questions on my email. Uh, you'll see my email at the end. Next one, please. So the project was born because a few years ago, with some collaborators from the States, we developed a, an oral vaccine. We gave this vaccine to laboratory rats and six out of 10 rats became infertile, which was amazing because it was the first time that anybody did this. However, if you look at how many baby rats, the remaining four rats can produce, particularly in a lifetime, we, we this was just the beginning. We were wanting certainly to increase the 60% to bring it up to 70, 80, 90%. So we were hoping to increase the vaccine efficacy. Next one, please. So this is the part that has gone on for uh, a couple of years. We are now midway through the project. We are aiming to have uh, at least 70% of the gray squirrels to make infertile. And we are testing various formulations of two sets of drugs. One is a vaccine. We are putting this vaccine into spores of club moss. Uh, this is an amazing technology developed by colleagues at Hull University uh, and by a company uh, called Sporomex. They are um, emptying the spores of club moss from their genetic material and filling it filling them with uh, whatever drugs is needed, in this case, our vaccine. Uh, so the, the spores carry the drug through the stomach where it's not destroyed because the stomach environment will not destroy the, the spores or, or pollen grains. Sometimes they use also plant pollen grains, but the spores will um, release the load in the intestine, which is where we want them to do it. So that's one set of trials uh, ongoing as we speak. They will be completed in spring 2021. In parallel, we are also testing a cholesterol mimic. So if you decrease cholesterol, you also decrease the sex hormones responsible for reproduction. So we are testing these in parallel to see which of these two or more candidates we want to take forward for the next trials. Next, please. So what we are going to do next is once we have a few candidates or at least a couple, we want to test different doses um, versus the duration of effect. We want to ensure that the efficacy um, of the efficacy of the uh, contraceptive once they are delivered in different baits because the bait type you deliver the contraceptive in might um, affect the absorption of the contraceptive. And then we want to go to field test. We are doing everything in the lab now uh, because we have fantastic uh, facilities to, to do this in the lab, but certainly we want to 
move to the field as soon as um, technically feasible. Next one, please. So in terms of delivering the oral contraceptive, so even if you had the perfect contraceptive that we have shown to be very effective in inducing infertility for uh, the majority of the population, the main, the next question is, how do you give it to two and a half million squirrels? Which is why we're, we are doing, and we've been very busy in these years to carry out a number of field studies to estimate the bait uptake uh, when, for when the bait by squirrels, when the bait will contain the oral contraceptive. We have used rhodamine B, that is a bait marker. If you add rhodamine B, which is this pink substance on the bottom of the slide, if you add rhodamine B uh, to any food and uh, an animal eats it, rhodamine B will uh, become available in hair and whiskers or detectable under UV light. So under UV light, the, the squirrels are bright pink or any, anybody in fact that eats it will be bright, will have bright pink hair. And so that's how we know whether a squirrel has eaten a bait that in the future will contain the contraceptive. Next, please. So this is a good example of a field study that we carried out in Wales uh, with the help of volunteers and several organizations. Um, we are delivering the contraceptive. We will be delivering the contraceptive. We're not delivering the bait through a bait hopper um, or a feeder that we have modified. This is something that was originally uh, designed by the Forestry Commission and we, we have uh, redesigned it to deliver contraceptives. Uh, on the right side of the slide, you have a woodland. The yellow dot on the top are uh, half of the woodland where we put bait without the marker, rhodamine B, and the bottom part of the woodland, uh, you have red dots where we put bait that contain rhodamine B. Then we waited for a week, then we went and removed the squirrels and looked in their hair to see who, how many had eaten the bait. Next, please. Uh, and we were relatively surprised by the results. So remember, this was trying to replicate what would happen in, in a few weeks time where you, you go out, you pre-bait some um, feeders that will contain the contraceptive, you wait for a few days and then you go back and you see how many um, squirrels have eaten the bait. So in the red area that contained the, red, uh, the marker, we had 71% positive squirrels for rhodamine B. So more than 70% uh, of the local squirrels had eaten at least one bait, at least, uh, yes, one bait um, that had the marker. Next one, in the adjacent wood, in fact, in, set, in the other part of the wood, very, very few squirrels, 7% had eaten the bait. These type of studies are necessary because we want to know if you put the bait with a certain uh, density of uh, feeders in a wood, how far would the squirrel come and how far do squirrel move to access the bait? So what is the area that would be affected by your uh, contraceptives? Next one, please. We did this on a number of woodlands, little wood, uh, small woodlands, like between six and uh, 15 hectares um, and uh, we looked in winter and in summer, three feeders per hectare, putting rhodamine B in, um, in the food for four days and then removing the squirrels to see what was the proportion of animals that ate the bait. Clearly in summer, summer does much better than winter because in summer you can have many more animals or a higher proportion of the population that consumes the bait which might be our chosen season, provided you can replicate these for larger woodlands. Next, please. And so these are the a list of things that we've done so far in the field. We have developed a feeder to monitor individual bait uptake. We need individual bait uptake because we need to know if you have a, if we develop a contraceptive, an oral contraceptive, 
we need to know, and, and it has to be given in a few doses, we need to know how many bait a squirrel will eat within in the course of a few days uh, from how many feeders and so on. So it's complicated by the ecology and behavior of, in this case, the squirrels. We have employed a marker to monitor population bait uptake. We have developed a density index based on camera traps. If anybody wants to know more about this, I can talk about it later. And we have assessed bait uptake in small woodlands. We are now in the process of assessing the amount of bait eaten per visit. And we are also, uh, we will also running trials to minimize, or in fact, have no bait uptake by non-target species, the red squirrel being obviously our, our main concern. Next one, please. So I think this is my uh, thinking slide about what else remains to be done and what are the, the main questions that we should be asking when using fertility control for wildlife. We need to think squirrels or, or other. We need to think about the effect, the effectiveness and the duration of the contraceptive. We need to know what is the proportion of the population to treat and to achieve the objective and in which time and how often we need to treat them. We need to think about the behavioral effects of contraceptive. We need to know how much do we need to reduce the population to affect the ecological or the economic impact. What are the costs of using chemical contraceptives? Is it feasible at a large scale? And have we considered alternatives? We are not necessarily saying fertility control is the only way. We are saying fertility control is an extra tool which could be added to culling or use on its own depending on the context. Next one. And I have a, a few final slides on something else that we've done on, on the wild boar on similar reasoning. So if we develop an oral contraceptive for squirrels, it's very, very likely that we'll be uh, affecting other mammals, the wild boar being one. So with this in mind, years ago, with some funding from DEFRA, we developed the BOSS, the Boar Operated System. And I can show you in a second how it works, but uh, the, the main species we are very worried about was the badger. Could the badger feed from these and, and then be conceptive, even if we don't want them to be affected? Uh, and we have hundreds of pictures with badgers trying to feed from the boss and being totally incapable because they don't have the behavior of uh, being able to do so. They, whilst the wild boar do. Next slide, please. And if this works, this is in the Forest of Dean. Uh, it's a little video to show you how the boss works. So these are wild boar, free living wild boar. They can easily learn to lift the cone, the metal cone. Lots of animals are eating. Another wild boar comes, she has a yellow nose. Wild boar don't have a yellow nose usually, but that is because we have a marker, a yellow marker around the cone, and they're all happily feeding from it. We've tested these in different countries around the world, and apart from bears, nobody else can uh, feed from it. So we have a very species specific way of delivering baits that one day will contain contraceptives or other vaccines for other diseases to wild boar. Next one. So when should we use fertility control? My standard answer is where lethal control is illegal, unacceptable, unfeasible, unsustainable, environmentally hazardous, or ineffective, or a combination of all of these. Next, please. This is my concluding slide. This is a wild boar swimming in a private swimming pool. Um, I believe and I know that it's a fact that human wildlife contests will continue to grow and we do not have a single silver bullet. However, we are developing evidence-based solutions. We are translating research into practical applications and we are identifying suitable species and contexts to use fertility control alone or in conjunction with other methods. Next, please, I would like to finish by thanking 
immensely the accord for the unwavering support um, and also DEFRA. Uh, DEFRA has been contributed to this project too. I would like to thank all my co-authors, collaborators and volunteers around the world. We are collaborating with many, many people on this work. You have my email at the bottom and I would like to leave you with a half minute video of a red squirrel that is trying our feeder and is very frustrated by it and is stomping its feet because it can't feed from it. Eventually it does, uh, which is why we are working on it. But this is a nice image of what we hope the future will be. So I don't know whether you can see it, but that squirrel is unable to enter completely or to access the bait inside, inside the feeder. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, let me know. Thank you very much, Giovanna. Do you just want to say why the red squirrel couldn't access the bait? Well, I have a look at the chat and the Q&As. Yeah. <laughs> So the, the red squirrel can access the bait because we are trying to, we are playing with the door that will make the access more difficult for smaller animals like the red squirrels. Um, and so we will be testing doors through which an animal can access the bait. And if the door is heavy enough, we are hoping that it will allow the greys in, but not the reds. Uh, or certainly not most of the reds. And we are lucky because we have camera traps now, so we can certainly monitor and record the behavior of these animals. And we know exactly who will feed from, from what. Also, we can monitor the amount of bait eaten. So if an animal goes in and is eating, we will know whether it has eaten or not because the, the bait inside the weight will decrease. Mm. Great, because there are, have been a number of questions, uh, concerns around either red squirrels or other animals, you know, non-target species being able to get hold of the bait and then obviously yes. causing issues for those populations. Yes, so, uh, so we have several answers to, to, to this question that is often asked. One is that uh, we are working, uh, we are putting a lot of effort into developing something that, and testing um, so that greys can feed from it but red cannot and uh, as I said we can monitor it and uh, change it or modify it um, but also as you if you remember the map that I've shown before the vast majority of the UK is grey unfortunately so in the mass, vast majority of the UK it doesn't matter if there are the red squirrels will never have access to the bait because there are no red squirrels and for other animals will definitely try it in areas where other animals of similar size um, can be or can access the bait. Mm. Great yeah because the idea is for it to be used in both red and grey and grey only areas isn't it? Yeah correct. Um, so uh, the, also another question that we've had is um, so uh, are there risks to other animals and bird species of predating and eating grey squirrels once they've eaten the bait? Okay, so what I haven't mentioned yet is where the project is, is going after this. So once we have the oral contraceptive, we have tested uh, that we can deliver it to at least uh, the majority of animals in small, small woodlands. We will go, would like to go bigger and, and test regions. Obviously, with the help of volunteers, we can't do it uh, all, all on our own. And that's where we will also look at um, re the registration of this drug. And part of the registration dossier is um, effect on the food chain. But we already know that if it is a vaccine, there will be no effect because if you eat a vaccine, you will digest it. And we say, unfortunately so, because if it wasn't the case, we would have an oral contraceptive already. So, um, for the vaccine is not a problem. For the cholesterol inhibitor, we'll definitely have to test these and how and whether it moves through the food chain before putting it out. Yeah. And somebody just uh, raised the issue of pine martins, who are obviously mm -hmm. quite a strong animal compared to the red squirrel. And again, uh, you know, preventing them accessing it. 
yeah. So, so we will also test the feeders in Pine Martin areas uh, and see what happens. And without whether, the contraceptive. <laughs> without the contraceptive. Yeah, the, the beauty of all these field trials is that we don't have to have a contraceptive to prove whether animals can access the bait or not. They will contain a contraceptive. Hmm. Yeah, great. Um, is there a strong case for continuing to develop both contraceptive tools? So if the vaccine and the diazocon were both successful? I'd love to. What I forgot to say is that any of these drugs will make infertile, it's very likely to make infertile any mammal. And as I've explained at the beginning, there's a, a big need for oral, oral contraceptive for a number of species. So that's why obviously we'd like to take forward more than one. Um, listeners should keep in mind that registering drugs is very, very expensive. Registering one drug is very, very expensive and registering one drug for one species is probably uh, non-viable economically. But if you register the same drug for several species, that becomes uh, palatable is the wrong, uh, is the wrong word, but that becomes important and, and viable. Great. And, and a few questions on when it might be available. <laughs> we, so when we started um, three years ago, we were ready to increase the effectiveness, um, the, the efficiency of, of the vaccine. So we are hoping to go 70, 80, 90, as I explained. We had a few setbacks. The pandemic was one, but we also had other setbacks before, which is why we have redoubled. We have invested more in the field side, but we have redoubled our efforts uh, for the development. And I would like to answer this question probably next spring, when we have a very good idea of which ones we would like to take forward. Yeah, and, and it will also be available. We, we always say, Let's assume that even both tracks of the cholesterol inhibitor and the vaccine are working very well. If they're working very well on a relatively small scale trial with laboratory rats to start with, then we are moving it to squirrels. And we are assuming, as we've seen already, that it should be transferable to squirrels in captivity. And after we've done the trial in captivity, we move to the wild. So that's why, it's, it's a complex study and it's a multi-step study. Another one for you, Giovanna. Um, could you tell us how you arrived at the 70% fertility target and will the offspring of those that do breed not be more successful if there's less competition? So um, the 70% is, uh, I, I can send uh, around to whoever is interested paper that we has just been accepted for publication comes from a modeling exercise and the 70% will be the minimum. And in that paper, we are also saying that so far we see as ideal culling to, to have a quick reduction in squirrels followed by fertility control. But we know, so that would be the ideal combination. We know that in some areas you will not be able to cull. In in many towns you will not be able to cull full stop. So we, we need to also deal with reality and, and say, okay, maybe in towns we will be able to keep the population low and maybe to do a lot of uh, educational um, awareness to explain to people why the cute gray squirrels should not be fed and be made fat. <laughs> Um, somebody asked, do you know the environmental resist resident time of the compounds used within the contraception for gray squirrel control? And is the risk of contraception, sorry, contraceptives affecting water courses, et cetera, in the longer term, I suppose, because there is this issue with human yeah. contraceptives, which are, which are hormone based entering Correct. the system. But that's not what we're working on, is it? Correct. Th th thanks, Kate, for, for, um, Kate for, for mentioning it, because I forget all, always these Yes, so human contraceptives, the, the famous pill, um, is based on hormones that then uh, went, go to the environment. In our case, uh, particularly the vaccine um, track, 
causes the opposite, reduces would reduce the amount of hormones that are in the environment. And certainly a vaccine is not a hormone, so it will not affect anything uh, in that respect. But also all, all uh, these things, all these questions are, are very relevant because for the registration dossier and the package, we will have to look at the transfer through the food chain, at the um, whether there is an environmental fate uh, and so on, or what is the environmental fate, if any, any and so on. Yeah. Um, and what timescales do you envisage before seeing a significant reduction if you're using fertility control only? This has been a bit part of the modelling, hasn't it? That That is part of the modelling. Uh, and I'll have to go back to modeling because I don't I don't really remember. Uh, but again, it depends on the proportion that you can achieve, that you can target, uh, how quickly you go down. But also remember that with fertility control, a contraceptive squirrels is not dead. It still can still be around for two, three, four years. Mm. So that's why culling is faster and fertility control is very likely to be more humane, but certainly slower. Yeah, because we've had a question about um, infertile squirrels still being able to therefore bark strip the trees. And I guess this would be the case. Um, you would probably be able to, because there's always that issue if you're going to use lethal control of not being able to get some of the, some of the last few squirrels. So the, having the fertility control in the wood would enable you to maybe get you know get more but um but there's also this interesting because we don't know the effects of the fertility control yet on the behavior of squirrels and does would potentially reducing the hormones um you know stop them bark stripping so much i i don't, I don't know the answer to that yet i don't think you really. do but no. or is it or is it more behavioral and or, or is it more nutritional absolutely we need to so the, these are various layers of answers that will will take a long time to answer uh, <laughs> but that's why i did put on um, uh, one part of my slide was we need to know by how much you need to decrease the density to prevent the damage and uh, we do have some anecdotal evidence from previous studies but not published, that if you do decrease significantly the number of squirrels in a woodland, the damage to trees will decrease. But I think it would be very, very useful to do it on a number of um, woodlands, to, to repeat that on a number of woodlands. We uh, I'm very happy that we do have, we have developed this method to, based on camera traps, to count the number of squirrels that are in a in an area. So you, you have a very good, if you if you count them before and then you start taking them out, let's say culling, you will have a very good idea on how many you have to take out or what proportion you have taken out before going to zero. Yeah, because we had another question in comparison to greys, how much do reds bark strip? And I know, I mean, we've we've published just this week a, a blog on our on our squirrel cord websites from the Lowther Estates, where they have about I think seventeen hundred acres of woodland, and they have a very positive relationship between their red squirrels, which they are trying to conserve, and um, their woodlands, which they manage for biodiversity and for um, uh, for uh, commercial timber purposes, and they actively keep out the grey squirrel one to protect their trees to prevent them coming in and then bark stripping, and two to for, for the red squirrels. But they don't have any issues with red squirrels in their in their woods bark stripping the trees. And the colleague in Northern Ireland has also said that previously, when Northern Ireland had a lot more grey squirrels, there were reports. There were lots of reports about bark stripping but now that they've managed to reduce the population and the red squirrels are, are coming back more they, 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 those reports aren't coming in anymore yeah yeah that, that also a number uh, an amazing number of um gray squirrel control groups throughout the uk they are doing some fantastic work and not only in reducing the number of gray squirrels but also in monitoring where the gray squirrels are compared to the reds uh, and so, yeah, crucial work, and we are hoping to work with a number of, of, of these groups because uh, they they will be the, the vectors of whatever tools we can develop. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, a couple of questions on can we be a trial site or how can forest, how can we as landowners and foresters um, become involved with helping and supporting the fertility control project? So um, I wonder whether, Kay, this is for you in terms of the, the yeah, raising of, of the awareness and, and the funding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we, we, I mean, we're certainly fun, still fundraising for the final uh, 250,000 um, to do for the last couple of years of the project. Um, so if anybody wants to donate to that, uh, they can go to the Squirrel Accord website uh, and go to the donate section. In terms of um, being involved in the trials at the moment for the for the current project, those trial areas have already been established, haven't they, Giovanna, until the end of the life of this project. Yeah. But we will then obviously, as Giovanna has said, have to go on to the registration process and, and go on to looking at landscape scale field trials. So there may be future opportunities if people are interested to be involved at that time. Yeah, we uh, we, we also have, we're, we're hoping to put together a proposal with um, several wildlife trusts about the feasibility of launching a fertility control campaign at county level or regional level so at that point we would really appreciate the collaboration of whoever is in that part of the world because it would be crucial because the other thing that i haven't mentioned yet is that for any wildlife that i worked on so far coordinated control is key to really make a difference and so if an area you have only 10% 20% of of the landowners that are happy for you to control wildlife for many species that's not enough so that's the other aspect that we should really look at and we can only do in collaboration with a number of organizations and, and partners in working already in this area Definitely. I mean, the, the grey squirrel management that goes on at the moment, the, the most successful uh, to, to protect the red squirrel is that that, you know, it is collaborative based, it's landscape at landscape scale um, and involves a lot of the landowners and local volunteers and organisations. Yeah, I would like to take this opportunity, Kay, to, to sing your glory or the glory of the UK Squirrel Accord, because the UK Squirrel Accord has been crucial in being a hub for all this exchange of information and uh, uh, website and interviews and materials that people can go to and have a really very detailed um, understanding of what's going on literally hour by hour. We, we are often, uh, Kay and I are often talking about the updates of the project and it's, it's great to have somebody that coordinates all of these efforts at national level. Thanks, Giovanna. It's wonderful to have you involved in the project as well as our, as our lead scientist. It's always fascinating. Um, and we will be organising future webinar events. So um, thank you very much for all of your questions. We've got a couple of questions. I don't know whether Charles is still with us. I've not seen him. <laughs> um, Oh, hello. Yeah, I'm still here. I've, I've been, while Joe's been chatting away, I've been answering all my questions online. Oh, so the, the few <laughs> few I had, I have dealt with and they've been very interesting. Um, we, do, we had uh, a couple come in. From, Are the current UK biosecurity measures being effective at preventing new pests and diseases from entering the country? This was sent in beforehand. Yeah, so I mean, you may not be aware, but currently uh, we're entering into a new phase with plant health and biosecurity. There's an e a new EU regulation which is taking effect, which will um, is ramping up at the moment. That regulation has been pushed by UK government for several years, and it actually strengthens plant health and biosecurity. So where uh, previously there'd only be a small number of plants which would be plant passported for movement in Europe, now all plants have to be plant plant passported. Um, so there has been a considerable strengthening in biosecurity and it's something that we have driven uh, and led upon and we're always looking to try and improve our biosecurity. And we've had a few questions on how to, to protect young trees from bark stripping and how do people protect their trees? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a it's a, a difficult question. Giovanna um, alluded to it earlier. I'm not sure we categorically understand why uh, grey squirrels choose to strip bark. There have been many, many theories. 
um, and there probably are several reasons why they bark strip. If we understood it was for nutritional reasons, perhaps there's something we could do about it. You know, if we understood why they did it, then perhaps we could come up with a, a solution. But because we don't understand why they do it, then it's very difficult to come up with a solution. Uh, and that is why we are struggling so with so many problems with gray squirrels, because if we understood why they did it, and then perhaps we could come up with alternatives. But we, we just don't understand that. And I'm not sure we will understand that, hence the need for a contraceptive. Yeah, because all, all we have at the moment are the traditional methods, as, as Giovanna pointed out, of the shooting and the trapping. Um, uh, potentially the pine martins as, as they recover may, um, although we're still looking at the evidence on that and, and uh, there was an issue raised about urban areas acting as refuges for pine martins and then the grey squirrels getting used to the predation and then moving back out into areas um, um, but hopefully things like the fertility control will be available in the future and, and will certainly help. Um, and uh, there's just a question on, are there certain trees that are more susceptible to bark stripping than others? And I, I know there are certain broadleaf trees, aren't there? They, like you've got your oaks and your hornbeams uh, uh, and yeah. field maples that often get really uh, damaged, but things like cherry, maybe not so much. Yeah, so I think, I mean, my understanding is predominantly broadleaf trees, but not exclusively broadleaf trees. They will uh, bark strip on uh, conifers. Again, we because we don't understand why they do it, it's difficult to understand why some conifers are being uh, bark stripped. Um, you know, why do they suddenly decide to bark strip? Aces, things like sycamore, particularly problematic, beech, hornbeam. Some of the thinner bark species tend to be their preference. The thicker bark tend to be less uh, problematic. Um, certainly when I first started with UK Squirrel Accord, uh, no one really mentioned ash as a particular species of concern. Um, but in my experience of being up in North Yorkshire, I have seen ash absolutely hammered by grey squirrels. Uh, and again, if we understood why they're doing it, is that population density? There are just so many grey squirrels now, there's not enough trees to bark strip. Uh, you know, that might be one of the drivers around it. So mainly a mainly thin bark broadleaf species, um, but they are they're not very finickety about what they will actually bark strip. And that's partly the problem. Yeah. Uh, and one that came before about um, uh, ash dieback now in, being endemic in the UK and how how can wildlife on that usually lives on, on ash dieback cope um, and are there replacements? Yeah, so there's been some really good work done by Natural England. There's a couple of good published reports about looking at the ecosystem value of ash. Uh, and if you are interested in that, there's some great reads online. I think what came out of that uh, publications um, is actually, you know, there's a, a broad range. I think there's up to a thousand different species that may use ash in part of their in their life. I think a, a small percentage are unique to ash. Um, so those which are not unique to ash may be able to sort of um, shuffle off to another tree species, but those which are unique to ash will be a struggle. Then looking at that ecosystem services, ash is quite a unique tree um, and there isn't a simple replacement. You don't go like ash, oh, well, I'll put a birch in. There isn't that simple. Actually, I think a, a panel of five different tree species provide all these sort of ecosystem services originally provided from ash. So, you know, in that, in, in that respect, it's a good thing that there isn't a simple replacement um, because, you know, Sod's law is that you'd replace ash with another species and that will come down with something else. So if you have to replace ash, which you will do, uh, then actually replacing it with a panel of different systems builds in greater resilience for the future. Um, and I think that's a very good thing to see, actually. But there are some good reports done by Natural England looking at ecosystem services and replacement strategies. Forest Research have done a very good operational note on ash dieback and managing it in woodlands. And Tree Council have done a really good report for urban and peri-urban situations. So there's lots of good information out there about ash. Thanks very much, Charles. And just going back to the grey squirrel uh, management methods, there is also um, from uh, Forestry Commission uh, and others uh, a really good technical note on, on good management methods for grey squirrels. Yeah. So people can look on that. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I think that's the end of the Q&A session. Um, there were some questions that were submitted beforehand are on different subjects to those that we're covering today, but I will try and answer them through future webinars um, with other experts. Um, and uh, thank you for your suggestion for other topics for events as well. I'll have a look through those and try and deliver them. Um, we've got a 
uh, fertility control update event coming up on the 19th of March and I'll put some more details on the website so keep an eye on the website about that where Giovanna will be back with some of the your colleagues won't you Giovanna to um, because we're about roughly through the halfway stage you know COVID, right. COVID lockdown did uh, delay things a little bit um, but so uh, we're about halfway through so we want to do a big public update so that'll be next March. Correct. Uh, one thing that I forgot, uh, Kay, unless Charles mentioned it and I missed it completely, was that all of this can also be put into the context of DEFRA's commitment to plant, I don't remember how many million of trees or hectares. So now is the time to really think about it because th there's no point in planting if the squirrels are hammering them. Yeah, that's a massive issues for woodland creation if, if, if this continues. Um, so just a final thank you to our speakers for sharing your time and your wisdom. It's always wonderful to speak to you both. Um, and thank you to everybody that's joined us today. Um, and I'll hope to see you in the future. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye now. Bye, bye, bye. Bye.